So now we're going to move on to the last speaker of this uh, session before we take a break. Um, so we'll uh, string it uh, um, uh, right away. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Grace Lindsay, uh, who's uh, joining us um, here. Uh, she's an assistant professor of psychology at the data science uh, and data science at the at NYU. Uh, Grace had um, did her PhD at Columbia University and then her postdoctoral research at uh, University College London. She uses bio-inspired artificial neural networks to probe relationship between neural activity and behavior. And uh, recently she's put out a wonderful book uh, entitled Models of the Mind, How Physics, Engineering, Mathematics Have Shaped Our Understanding of the Brain. Uh, and so uh, today she's going to talk to us about visual processing and an embodied artificial rodent trained through reinforcement learning. So uh, Grace, please take it away. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so I just started my lab at NYU, but this is work that I did while I was a postdoc at UCL. Uh, so the, the background, the motivation for um, the work that I'm going to talk about kind of starts with the fact that visual neuroscientists for the past several years have been studying convolutional neural networks as models of biological visual processing. And this stems from the fact that the basic computations of a convolutional neural network, the convolutional layer and the pooling layer, um, were inspired by the basic functions of simple and complex cells that Hubel and Weasel discovered in cats uh, many decades ago. So there's a kind of basic functional um, analogy between these networks and the basics of how the visual ventral stream works. Um, and then the way that uh, the comparison and, and the use of these networks as models usually goes is that models are trained to do um, some sort of uh, visual task. And then the same image is shown to the networks as is shown to the brain or shown to a subject. And then neural activity is recorded from the brain and the representations of the network is compared to the representations of the brain, either by trying to predict the real neural activity using the artificial neural activity or using things like representational similarity analysis. Um, for a while, uh, these networks, which were becoming quite uh, successful at matching real neural activity, certainly compared to any of the previous models of visual processing that were in use, um, they were usually based on supervised training of these deep convolutional neural networks um, on object recognition tasks. And of course, there's a lot of reasons why supervised learning is not um, biologically realistic, and it's not how we think that the full you know, evolution and development of the visual system occurs, um, because you're not relying on tons and tons of explicitly labeled data to um, build a biological visual system. So that was always kind of unsatisfying that you had to use that kind of supervised task to get networks that had good uh, matches to the brain. Uh, but more recent work has looked at uh, unsupervised methods, um, particularly uh, contrastive methods, um, of which there are, are many different uh, methods in that general camp of contrastive learning. Uh, and that work, due to the advances in, in um, unsupervised learning or self-supervised learning and uh, contrastive methods, uh, recent work has shown that you actually can get uh, decent matches to uh, real neural activity using these unsupervised networks. Uh, so this um, plot here from work in the Amons lab shows that in red these contrastive uh, networks and how when compared to the supervised networks in black, you can actually get a match to different uh, regions of uh, macaque visual cortex, uh, a match that's uh, pretty uh, equal to the, the supervised uh, network. So this was showing that unsupervised methods could actually work um, and that's great because they have um, more, you know, natural relationship to how the brain might actually learn in terms of not requiring labeled data. Um, but that leaves one major type of learning out of the equation. Um, and, it, you know, it's not entirely clear how we could use reinforcement learning to train these visual systems in a way that would relate to how um, biological agents actually use their, their vision. Um, and so I was interested in what happens if you um, use reinforcement learning to train a visual system, not just in a, a kind of superficial way where technically you have a reinforcement learning objective, but really you're still just using a kind of disembodied uh, convolutional neural network. But what if you actually had a visual system that um, was part of a larger uh, agent in a body that it needs to control and it needs to do tasks? What would the properties of that kind of system uh, look like compared to these previous systems that were trained with supervised and unsupervised learning? So that's the focus of this work. 
Um, and the thing that's interesting about reinforcement learning, uh, one is that you can talk about an agent rather than just kind of a network or a model. We call it agents in, in reinforcement learning because they are, they do have some something special about them, which is that the model has to produce actions that then impact the world or impact its experience of the world, which then uh, feeds back into the inputs that it gets. So you're not just working with a static data set that you train a model on, but rather the model itself is generating the data that it learns from. So that can lead to interesting properties and also just the fact that you're using this um, these input images, the input data to generate actions rather than simply to label something or understand something about the input data itself that also suggests a, a different um, you know, desired way of processing that uh, input data. So, um, and of course, deep reinforcement learning based on visual inputs has been successful in recent years. So this is an example of uh, the Atari paper from DeepMind, um, and that was using visual inputs of the Atari video games in a deep reinforcement learning system to generate um, outputs in the game space. So we know that this kind of learning can take in visual inputs and use them in a meaningful way. Uh, so, but the particular system that I studied in this work um, is, uh, it came out of, uh, also out of DeepMind, and um, it's actually, uh, rather than just kind of um, a game playing agent, it's actually an embodied uh, agent in the sense that the goal of the agent is to control a physical body, and that physical body is uh, meant to replicate uh, a rodent. And so uh, this is kind of the the, the physical body that the model has to control, it has um, 38 degrees of freedom uh, in terms of joint angles and tendons. That's kind of the output of the reinforcement learning system. It has to output these joint angles and tendons. So this is low level body control. It's not like move left, move right. It's how do you actually make the muscles in the body um, move the animal to achieve um, goals. And it exists in a, in a simulated physical world and it uses sensory inputs to, um, to create the uh, understanding of the goals that it needs to achieve and um, to control its body. So the sensory inputs that it has is a proprioceptive system, which gives feedback about um, things like if the different paws of the rodent are touching anything and also the, um, the kind of position of the rodent in space and all of that. Uh, and then it also gets visual input. Uh, it gets, despite the fact that it's kind of drawn as having uh, two eyes, it actually gets a single uh, egocentric visual input from the center of its head as it explores the environment. And this is what the actual architecture of the model looks like under the hood. So this vision encoder gets that egocentric input. Um, and then the proprioceptive encoder gets the uh, proprioceptive input and uh, the vision encoder is a ResNet. The proprioceptive encoder is just a simple MLP. Those feed into recurrent layers that eventually produce the distribution of action values. So the distribution of the um, joint angles and tendon values that control the rodent body. The tasks that the rodent is trained to do through reinforcement learning are these four different tasks that are meant to kind of uh, capture a broad diversity of how the animal would need to use its body and its sensory input. So the first is um, a running task where it has to jump over gaps and it gets reward that's proportional to how close it is to a target velocity. So it needs to keep running at a fast speed while jumping over um, random gaps in, in the uh, land in front of it. And then another task is it needs to navigate a maze. So it has to go through a maze and find these blue orbs and touch them all to collect them. Another task is to escape um, a valley with very uneven terrain. So it's kind of starts at the, um, the, the lowest point in a bowl. It needs to climb out and it gets reward proportional to how far it is from its starting point. And then finally, there's a two tap test that's inspired more directly by some um, tests used in, in the laboratory. And so the animal has to tap this orb and then wait a fixed amount of time and tap it again. And it needs to learn what that fixed amount of time is through exploration. And uh, the rodent, it's the same agent and all of these tasks, it's not given an explicit cue that tells it which task it's in. It's just needs, it just needs to kind of sense its surroundings to understand what the goal is in any uh, given situation. Situation. 
So this is video of the trained rodent. Uh, you can see on the left the egocentric input that the animal gets. So this is um, uh, what is going into that ResNet vision encoder. As the animal runs around this environment, you can see that it does learn to successfully control its body and learns to be able to visually identify these orbs and then go get them. This is the gaps uh, running task where it needs to see that there is a gap coming up in the uh, uh, track that it's on and control its body in a way where it will be able to successfully jump over those gaps. Uh, so the animal achieves pretty good performance uh, on these on all four of these different tasks. Okay, so that's the full rodent and, and what it's trained to do. I, as I said, I'm interested in the visual system. So this visual system, which is embedded in this bigger agent, uh, what did this visual system learn and how does that differ from a visual system that would have been trained in a supervised or unsupervised way, um, how, how that sort of visual system would have learned. So to answer that question, um, I'm going to take the same core ResNet architecture that's used in the um, the artificial rodent, and I'm going to train it using images that are sampled from the rodent exploring in its environment, but I'm going to train it in several different ways so that I can get a bunch of comparisons where the architecture and the data is held constant, but the learning procedure is different. And so I'm going to use four different um, supervised approaches and three unsupervised approaches, and then have those networks that I can compare to the network that was trained as part of the reinforcement learning agent. So the first supervised network um, is trained to predict reward. So you input a single frame from the rodent exploring its environment, and the task is to predict the reward that the rodent it was about to get on the next frame. And sometimes that's easy. You know, if you can imagine the rodent is kind of near one of those blue orbs in the uh, maze task, and sometimes it's more difficult, but uh, the network learns to do this decently well. Uh, the next network is trained to predict the animal's uh, 3D orientation in space, uh, so kind of how its head is tilted as it's running around, and so there's three um, output dimensions there, and as you can imagine from visual input, this isn't um, so terribly difficult, and so the network learns pretty well. And then uh, the other, uh, another supervised network is trained to categorize which of those four tasks the animal is in in any given moment based on a single frame. And then finally, the last supervised network is trained to do all three of these tasks simultaneously with three different readout heads. And you can see here that the um, performance of this uh, network that has to do all three tasks, which is shown as in black, it actually uh, has some performance gains over some of the networks that were trained only on individual tasks. So this is just um, multitask learning, kind of giving you perhaps better, more general representations to do all kinds of different tasks. So that's just uh, an interesting side effect of, of this work. Uh, and then the unsupervised models, uh, the first one is a simple autoencoder that's uh, meant to uh, recreate the input images. And you can see here that it gets the general features, but it's losing a lot of the detail. Uh, and then a variational autoencoder, which um, in terms of um, metrics on um, uh, pixel values uh, performs a bit better than the, the regular autoencoder. You can see here it's capturing some of the, the detail. And then finally, um, a contrastive predicting coded, predictive coding network, which um, essentially is able to um, tell if two frames shown are, uh, are uh, uh, temporally connected, if these two frames occurred um, one after another versus two frames that were just randomly selected from the uh, animal's navigation. So this is a summary of all the different models I just described. There's the four supervised models trained on either three individual tests or one model trained on all of them. And then the three unsupervised models. I'm also comparing to um, untrained models. So just random initialization of weights. Uh, and then of course the model that came from the, um, the artificial rodent. Uh, and so you can see that these models have different kind of output dimensionality. Um, which uh, will be relevant as we discuss later, but um, also I just want to um, note that three random instantiations of each network type were trained. So just, that's to, to control for effects of just random seeds. Uh, so this is a summary of the transfer learning performance of these different models. So basically taking the models that were trained for one thing using their last layer and then training a, a readout of different um, tasks. And so obviously the networks that were trained specifically to do things like task classification um, perform highly on, on task classification. Um, but then you can see 
um, the difference in performance across the different networks. But of course, I want to focus on the reinforcement learning agent. And what you can see here is that um, it does pretty well in terms of um, classifying what task the animal was in better than the untrained models, but uh, not so much better than some of the unsupervised models or more the supervised models. Um, and the same is kind of true for reward prediction and orientation prediction. Um, it's doing all right, but not better than the supervised models. So that's just one way of reading out kind of what the reinforcement learning agent is doing. Um, but what I wanted to do was look more at the representations of these um, these different networks. And so I recorded activity from four different layers in uh, these networks, the mainly from the rectified linear unit uh, right after each of the pooling layers, and then also the very last layer of the network. And so in the rodent, this last layer is the only thing that goes on to the rest of the network. This is the only output um, that feeds into uh, the, the rest of the agent. So I'm going to uh, look at activity at each of these different layers in the network and compare across the different models. Uh, so to do that, I'm first going to do representational similarity analysis, which involves creating these dissimilarity matrices. Um, and uh, you can see here, uh, this is showing uh, all of the images and how uh, dissimilar each of these networks represents those images. And the images are grouped by the task that the rodent is in uh, uh, for each of them. And so this is showing the reinforcement learning trait agent and an example of another uh, model, the supervised model that was trained on task classification. And you can see that by the last layer of this uh, network, you can see very strong structure here where um, the all the images that are from the same task have low dissimilarity and images that are from different tasks have higher dissimilarity. And you can actually see some of that structure in the reinforcement learning trait agent, even though um, it wasn't explicitly you know, asked to do that classification. Okay, so this is uh, the representational similarity across all of the networks. So the similarity between all of those dissimilarity matrices. And um, first you can just see that on the um, diagonal, there's these three by three blocks, which are just the models that were trained um, with the three different random seeds. So that's kind of reassuring that for the most part, those models trained um, from different random initializations uh, tend to learn roughly similar representations. Um, but then the other kind of broad effect that you can see here is that at the first layer, there's a lot of similarity across all the different models. We have high similarity values here. Um, and then by the time you get to the last layer, that's when you actually start to see differences in the networks that were trained in different ways. And um, it's kind of hard to see here because the reinforcement learning model is just one row at the bottom because we didn't have three different um, virtual rodents. Um, so here I'm just summarizing the average similarity values to um, all of the other types of networks for each of the types of networks. And so you can see here the general trend I just said where um, um, the last layer has the lowest similarity across the network, so that's in black here um, for all the different networks, but then also you can see that the reinforcement learning agent um, also just on average has kind of lower similarity values compared to all the other networks, so it's a little bit of an outlier um, in this, this metric. Um, but I, uh, you know, that's kind of a, a general finding, but the question is what makes the reinforcement learning train model different? Why does it... Um, have any kind of different similarity values or what are other properties of the reinforcement learning trained agent that makes it different. And I'm going back to these dissimilarity matrices because one thing you can see here, um, these are all plotted on the same color scale. And you can see that the reinforcement learning agent just has higher dissimilarity values, meaning that for any two um, images, it's kind of always representing them differently. It doesn't really kind of collapse images to be represented similar to each other. Everything's represented pretty dissimilar, dissimilarly. Um, and so that's an interesting feature that um, could be related to the fact that this model was trained with reinforcement learning to actually produce um, you know, useful behavior. So to look more into that, um, I used a, a measure that's um, somewhat common in the neuroscience lim literature, which is sparsity. Uh, particularly, this is lifetime sparsity. So it's a measure of essentially how selective a neuron is to the stimuli that you show it. And so this measure is one if the cell only responds to one stimulus and is silent in response to all other stimuli you show it, and it's zero if it responds to all stimuli equally. So if a neuron is very sparse, it only responds to one image out of all the images that I show it, um, then uh, yeah, this metric would be one. Uh, and so I know this is kind of a lot to look at here, but um, 
you can see there are a few general trends. One is that for a lot of these layers, the sparsity values across the population are pretty broad. That's why you have these kind of large um, error bars in the violin plots. Um, but a trend that you can definitely see, especially as you go um, into the later layers of the network, is that the reinforcement learning agent on the far right here um, is much sparser than the rest of the, the network. So it's really having a lot of neurons that are responding almost to you know only one or a handful of the test images that I'm using to compute this sparsity value. So that's a way in which the reinforcement learning age, uh, agent is different from other models. Um, a related metric to look at is dimensionality. And the um, reason that that's relevant here is that um, the, uh, the dimensionality kind of also reflects how much of the encoding space the neural population is using. And so in a sparse representation, you might imagine that that means you kind of have one neuron for each image and each neuron therefore is very important. And so kind of the full dimensionality of the, the space is being used. Um, versus a situation where neurons are more correlated and they're all kind of commonly responding to a bunch of stimuli together. And so looking at a measure of dimensionality um, that is the uh, the number of principal components that's required to explain 85% of the variance in the uh, activity, you can see that the reinforcement learning agent is an outlier at most of these uh, layers. So certainly at layer two, it has very high dimensionality compared to all the other models. And at layer three, and then at layer four, it's also higher than the rest. The only one that's comparable is one of the um, untrained models. So really compared to the other models that are actually trained on different uh, tasks, uh, the reinforcement learning agent is showing much higher dimensionality. Uh, so it's really using its neural space to a fuller extent than the other models. Okay, um, so one of the reasons that you might expect that the output of the um, visual system in the RL agent, you know, why it might need higher dimensionality is that maybe it's because the agent has to control this high dimensional body. It has, you know, 38 degrees of freedom to control this body, whereas these other supervised tasks are much lower dimensional. Um, so that's possible, although it is the case that the autoencoders technically have higher dimensionality in terms of what they need to ultimately output. Um, but perhaps there is something about controlling um, a, a 38 uh, dimensional body that is making this visual system have high dimensional activity. Uh, and so to answer that question, uh, we try to do essentially imitation learning, which is when you use supervised learning to train a network to replicate the policy that was produced by, um, by an agent. And so this is just taking the, again, just taking the ResNet and um, doing supervised learning, getting an input image and having it predict what the um, 38 degree output would be of the rodent in response to that input image as it explored the environment. And what I'm showing here is basically that that failed. Um, we weren't able to get a model to be able to learn that transition between an input image and the actions that the rodent produced. Um, but if you recall the, um, the architecture of the full agent, it also got proprioceptive input. And so perhaps that you know, is an important thing to um, combine with the visual input to be able to predict the output of uh, the agent, and then that would produce a model where we could learn about, um, you know, the, the role of vision in producing this high dimensional action output. So by including um, the proprioceptive input, uh, it does make the model a lot better at being able to predict the, um, the actions that the, the rodent took. Uh, and so then I thought, okay, well, now I can study this ResNet like I studied the other ones. I can look at this activity and understand if it's high dimensional as well. Um, but then when I went to do that, I realized that all of the activity in the ResNet was zero. The, the training procedure essentially learned to completely ignore the vision input and set all of the um, the, the activity of the ResNet to zero. And so really all of this um, this performance is relying just on the proprioceptive input. And uh, to further verify that that's what was going on, um, I uh, looked at this model that was trained with the vision and proprioceptive input, um, its performance when it was given both types of inputs, its performance when it was um, when I was actually setting the image itself to zero, and you see there's no difference in that. It doesn't care about the visual inputs at all. And then also a network trained just on proprioceptive input also performs just as well. There's only a tiny dip here because technically this network has one fewer layers than uh, this combined network. Uh, 
Um, and then of course the performance of the vision alone is very low. Uh, so an implication of this is that the, the way that the agent is using its visual input, it's not directly related to the immediate control of its body. Um, we know that it's using its visual input because the tasks rely on it. You can't do the, the gaps task or the you know, task where you're getting the orbs or any of those things without visual input. It needs that visual input to do the tasks. But as you could imagine, maybe it's using that visual input for longer term planning. So the output of the visual system is feeding into these recurrent layers um, that can hold on to that information for longer. And the um, immediate next step uh, action planning of the body is being driven more by the appropriate receptive input combined probably with visual input from past time steps. Um, and so I think that that's um, perhaps has relevance to how we understand the brain and study the brain, because um, there is a tendency to chunk parts up and say, this is the visual system and we can use it to study, um, you know, visual inputs and we don't have to think about its use in downstream tasks so directly. Um, but obviously, uh, these sensory systems are providing inputs that are used on many different timescales for many different tasks. And it may be that some of the features of relevance um, are best understood in, in light of those downstream systems, even though that's obviously very hard to do. Uh, and then finally, you know, we have this virtual rodent and it's doing visual tasks. And so it might be natural to ask, can this virtual rodent, um, is its neural activity at all similar to a real rodent? A real animal. Um, and so I'm using here the um, the Allen Brain Observatory data set that has um, two photon recordings from many different mouse visual areas. Uh, the networks are being shown these um, natural scenes, the natural images um, with a reduced dimensionality to uh, match the dimensionality that the networks are trained on. Um, and then I can compare the real neural activity to the model neural activity. And so this is showing uh, normalized representational similarity analysis outputs for that comparison. And again, the reinforcement learning model is all the way on the right here in brown. And uh, what you can see is that actually, if you want to um, match the, the representational patterns of mouse visual cortex across these different brain regions, the, uh, the reinforcement learning agent is the best match uh, across them. The contrastive predictive coding model in green uh, has occasional times where it's doing the same or better, but on average, it's not doing as well. Um, so that is um, that, that you know, supports this notion, perhaps, that the visual system is uh, kind of using, creating representations that are meant to drive diverse actions. Um, and so that's why this kind of very high dimensional representation that's created by the, um, the reinforcement learning agent here is able to capture these different areas. Uh, it's a little odd that it's the same layer in the model that's, that's doing best at all of the different um, uh, brain regions of the mouse. You might expect a more hierarchical relationship, um, but it still shows some benefit of using reinforcement learning uh, to train these these kinds of models. So to summarize, um, I trained models with supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning and showed that uh, the overall similarity is pretty high at the beginning stages of the model, but you get much more unique responses as you uh, go through the model layers. And the reinforcement learning trait agent is an outlier by many measures, including sparsity and dimensionality. Um, but the way to think about what the reinforcement learning trained agent is doing uh, is not so much in terms of thinking about the direct action space that the agent has to control, but more about how that visual input is integrated into um, the kind of middle part of the network that's able to coordinate longer term goals. Um, and you can kind of understand why then you have this high dissimilarity value because um, you know, if you're looking at, say, one of those blue orbs down uh, in front of you, a very small difference in the actual pixels in the input image could require very different bodily movements to get the rodent to that orb. And so you'd want the, the visual system to take in that input. And even though maybe these images are pixel-wise somewhat similar, it wants to represent them as very different in uh, its uh, the output of the visual system space so that they, that can go on to create very different actions down the line. Um, and then the reinforcement learning trained agent did provide the best match of these models to mouse visual data.
So I want to thank my collaborators. Josh Merrill at DeepMind built this uh, virtual rodent. And um, when I was uh, at UCL, I was working with Tom Erdick Flogel and Manish Sahani. And uh, this um, work is available on archive if you want more details. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. So we have time for a few questions. I think Joel is the first one to the line. Yeah, really, really lovely stuff. And I especially like the way you can compared the same architecture trained in the different uh, ways. I thought that was, uh, was really good. Uh, one question for you, though, I, sort of thinking about the irrelevance, at least for short term predicting the policy, the irrelevance of the visual input sort of got me thinking about these results from Nick Steinmetz and others about kind of everything being everywhere in the brain. And I mm -hmm. wonder if the explicit segregation in your deep rodent architecture between the proprioceptive and uh, visual inputs might be partly responsible for why you see that the, the visual side is not necessary. Uh, and I wonder if that hints at a better uh, architecture for mimicking the brain being one that, that does not have that explicit segregation. Um, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and even getting feedback from the recurrent layers back to the visual system to kind of modulate visual processing based on the current uh, goals of the agent. Um, I think that would be really interesting to study as well. Fortunately, it's pretty computationally expensive to train these kinds of um, embodied models. So there wasn't a lot of architecture testing, um, but yeah, that definitely seems like that would be relevant. Okay, I think. Yeah, uh, hi, Grace. Um, uh, great paper. Uh, so I'm interested, of course, in, in, in motion processing. Uh, it seems like your network is learning something, like it uses the vestibular information to just figure out where to move the muscles next of this virtual rodent. And then it uses the images to do this high-level planning. But by nature, it doesn't have any like optic flow information or you know short-term memory about the, uh, the inputs. Um, can you speculate about what would happen if you did that and if you think it would like kind of bridge that gap? Yeah, um, so the, the visual outputs do feed into recurrent uh, layers, you know, that could be doing some sort of integration, but the, I guess, just the temporal resolution of it, I mean, you saw the videos, it's getting kind of coarse grain frames um, and having coarse grain movements to some extent. Um, so to relate it directly to um, processing of, of optic flow in um, in animals, I think would probably require using a model that has um, has better temporal resolution, um, where you could actually kind of extract that kind of thing, especially the way the animal moves. It's really kind of uh, facing different directions at different points in time. And I don't know that you get a lot of um, clean optic flow data from that. Um, but yeah, of course, if you wanted to understand more naturalistic uses of um, visual information and, and temporal visual information, um, it would be really um, important that you have that. And I think that actually relates also to this idea of having feedback and things from other parts of the model. You know, if the part of the model that's producing the motor outputs is feeding back to the visual system to send a, a copy of that information to say, this is how you're going to move. So account for that when you're doing your visual processing. Um, that would be really interesting to be able to study as well. Okay, we'll take one question from Zoom and then uh, one more. Yes, uh, great talk. The question is from Ricardo. Uh, it relates to the first part of the talk when you talked about CNN and their relevance. Uh, he says, even though they are not brain inspired, how do you think a vision transformers would uh, be performed in this task? Um, yeah, that's a, a common question as to how kind of transformers fit in here. Um, I mean, it, I'm sure that they would be fine at embedding the image and, um, you know, extracting useful information for passing on to the, the rest of the agent. I can't really speculate on how different forms of training those architectures would lead to different representations just because I didn't test it. Um, but yeah, because they are less um, kind of relevant for understanding components of the visual system, I think that they would kind of offer less in this realm of wanting to compare directly to concepts from visual neuroscience. 
And then maybe one last question before the break. Thanks for the talk. I love the approach of trying to understand animal behavior in a way that is stimulus computable. So really excited about these results. I was struck by your dimensionality analysis, which to me, to have an untrained model have a higher dimensionality. I might have missed some, a piece of this, um, but to have an untrained model have a higher dimensionality than the trained models, for me, suggests that there's something about the stimulus set that's kind of pushing you into a wonky space. Um, as I'm sure you're familiar with, um, Oran Nayabi has some work on kind of finding that, in fact, unsupervised measures, unsupervised uh, signals actually lead to the best correspondence between comnets and the mouse visual system. Um, of course, in that work, if you're familiar with it, um, it they used a really kind of like degraded image net uh, uh, information, uh, whereas you're using something which is a little more closer to like a home cage environment. But nonetheless, you're in a very impoverished stimulus space. So I wonder whether or not you'd expect to see a boost in the predictive power of the unsupervised uh, learning signal, given a richer sensory data set. Um, yeah, I, um, yeah, I could see how, um, that would be expected. Uh, it still does depend, I guess, on the, um, the objectives of the specific unsupervised, um, uh, model. Um, what was kind of surprising here was the difference between the variational autoencoder and the regular autoencoder in terms of these, uh, dimensionality. Um, metrics as well. Uh, what I also wanted to point out is this um, dotted line here is the, the 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 dimension of the pixel space according to this metric, um, and so uh, it is kind of higher than uh, the dimensionality that the random network ultimately achieves um, here. Um, yeah, I don't know how to think about um, the role of the the data here in that way, because it does seem like it depends so much on the objective function. Obviously, it depends on the data, but um, yeah, because in the supervised tasks, you're explicitly trying to collapse them to these low dimensional spaces to do the classification of kind of a low dimensional, you know, output variable. Um, I think it, it would be interesting to see which unsupervised method leads to um, the highest dimensionality. But you could also imagine that that's not um, desirable in most cases. I don't know. You know, what are those dimensions representing, and are they kind of just making the representation noisy? Um, yeah. So to know that unsupervised methods can create good representations by certain you know analyses um, without always having to create high dimensional uh, representations, you know, it, it questions what what is the role of the high dimensional representation. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Let's uh, thank Grace once again. Thanks.